Good afternoon. In my name is Kashanki Ayanchu. My name is Howard Tsai, lecturer and program coordinator at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Michigan. Today, I have the wonderful opportunity to speak to Dr. Sergio Miguel Huacaya. He's professor of anthropology at the Pacific University in Lima, Peru. This is part of a series of conversations that I will be interviewing scholars and investigators who work in the Andean region of South America. So, Dr. Sergio, so nice to talk to you today. Nice to talk to you. How are, how are you? Good, good. So, let's start. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and um, uh, where have you worked and uh, what was, what was the, the research problem that, that you, you came up with? Uh, my, I, I started my dissertation in, in Ecuador, in, in Otavalo, and basically asking about the emergence of ethnic consciousness. So when the indigenous Andean people start becoming aware, basically, of the political power of ethnicity. And this, uh, because if we think about like 40 years ago, in, in Otavalo, in the place where I started my research, there was not, people were not aware that actually they have a, a culture that they can claim uh, ownership. And also, they were not aware that these cultures have some political power if you can mobilize it. Okay, and uh, so I start first by research in Ecuador, but after publishing a few articles, uh, I moved to Peru, uh, and now I am studying with basically the same ideas. I'm studying a, a specific uh, group in, uh, in Apurimac, mm. uh, uh, in the province of Cotabambas, mm. in which there's a, a group of communities that are starting to claim to be a nation by, by themselves. Mm. And the name of this nation is Yanawara, which is actually a, a colonial any group, right? But it was forgotten for centuries. Now, so they have uh, uh, just recently have started to talk ab about this Yanawara again, and, uh, and the theoretical issues that I deal with are have to do with most of the research speaks in terms of strategy, or or in a way to making like a. Uh, performing to be indigenous just to, to get some concessions from states or from NGOs or but what I discovered is that Australia is part of the, the, the question or the, of the but you have to do a lot more with uh, something else which is the social construction of indigeneity mm -hmm. it's how, how indigeneity how was seen was valued through history mm -hmm. and in order my, my claim is that in order to, to claim an indigenous political position, you have to change social reality. Because previously, nobody wants to claim to be indigenous because it was uh, so stigmatized. People were ashamed, right. ashamed in their emotions mm. to be indigenous. Nobody wants to claim. Right. But now, these are changing. Now, now the question probably is, well, why some groups do it and other groups don't do it? Some groups are very similar. And uh, what it is going to happen more broadly in Ecuador with the indigenous movement in the 90s and 2000s, but it hasn't happened really in Peru. Peru, there are some pockets of this ethnic consciousness, but, it, but it's not like a national phenomenon. Is, is it very interesting to have Peru and Ecuador as two comparative cases mm -hmm. it, it, when examining uh, the rise of indigeneity? Yes, it's, they are very, it's very interesting to compare them because even though they have similarities, there are also some contrasting uh, perspectives. And, uh, and in, in Ecuador, the, really the, it has a very powerful this movement is from the 1990s with a huge uprising, which really transformed society because people were believing at the time that these people become extinct, mm. but since then they have become prominent, and they, they have changed reality in terms of uh, before the nineties nobody could imagine like uh, having indigenous persons as uh, mayors, mm. 
or as a foreigner's representatives. It was unimaginable. Nobody could think about it. But now in Ecuador, you have those. You have mayors. You have, you have people that have represented the states in foreign countries. And, uh, so, and, and you have people in positions of power. Of course, it's not as easy, but still, you never seen those before. In Peru, they, that's, that's have not happened yet. Well, we, we don't know if it's going to happen, but it's not happened to that stakes. And, and uh, still, there's a lot, of, mainly in Lima, there's a lot of discrimination. And Lima, in a way, it has so powerful that, in a way, broadcast its perspective due to the whole country. But it's very different in, in the place where I'm doing research, which is uh, in which racism is really not, not as is in Lima. It's very different. Mm -hmm. So it's very, yeah. And I guess the interesting thing is how things have changed in Ecuador, but in, in Peru there's a potential to change, but we don't know if it's going to happen or not. And you did a lot of your research in Otavalo, in Ecuador, uh, a lot of your, your, your field research. Can you tell us a little bit about um, yes, yes, in, in, that investigation? In, in Otavalo, i done research about the way in which indigenous people presented themselves in, in the recent past, a few decades ago, because they were explicitly submissive, even though to extend to kneel and kiss the hand of the of the patron of the of the, of the land owner mm. of the yeah and uh, and this is the pattern throughout the Andes and I have seen it when I was very a little child mm. and and so one of the questions in, in that research well what what is going on here mm. what's happening are they acting that submission or do they believe that submission mm. to what extent is a performance mm. or not. And nobody has explained really, really this well, but I think my approach is to think of indigeneity that it, in a way is normative by this edit, uh, Judith Butler concept of performativity mm -hmm. in which uh, little acts actually construct a person. Yes, normative acts, how to have to behave yourself in. In relation to the other, usually with more power than mm -hmm. yourself, and so the indigenous people have to behave in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And uh, up to the eighties, or in Otavalo, the indigenous people have to lower down their eyes when they see a mestizo. They couldn't look directly. If they look directly, something was wrong. You see, they all have to lower their eyes. Mm -hmm. That was the performativity of the behavior. Mm -hmm. And my my uh, argument is that with this is one side of indigeneity. The other side is performance in terms of a conscious uh, act. Performative is unconscious. You, you don't notice it. You only notice it when something is wrong. Mm. And uh, but performance is conscious. You do it. You, know, you grab a guitar and start playing. That's a performance. You are conscious so that you raise the level of right. consciousness. Right. Okay. And, and since the 90s, probably a little before, in not a lot, they discovered this, the power of performance as indigenous peoples to actually um, accumulate political power, right? Because, because that allows them to skip local oppression because they, they were able, through performance, to get uh, allies from national allies or even international allies and, and break apart that, like, the, like the local dichotomy of power. And, and, and my argument is that with performance, with conscious performance, they have been able to break apart the previous normativity in which the indigenous have to be so, so submissive, you see? And that has changed. And they, in, in ECOR, there's a lot of less stigma than before. Now, now, uh, even though it's not a problem solved, but still, it's a lot more. There's a lot more pride in being indigenous than before. It's a lot more respected. In Peru, not so. In Peru is still very conflicting. It still leads to a lot more racism mm -hmm. it's because they didn't have this moment of, uh, in a way, a moment of liberation. Mm. So, what happened in Otavalo? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Change the situation of discrimination and right. instill a sense of pride. Yeah, in, in, in Otavalo they start becoming aware of the political power of, of culture from the 70s. And this cultural awareness actually was before the political awareness. Right? And uh, so they start to discover and rewriting who they were because they supposedly were stigmatized and not valued. You know? But for the 70s, who also have to do a lot with intentional contacts that start to value local in this culture. And then, then what, what, and, and what I have found is there's a moment of a revelation in, in, in which people start to discover how wonderful is their own culture. They didn't know that before. They have, they have the culture, they go to the festivity, the feast, the dance, but they were not aware, consciously aware, what is this? Uh, and uh, and how, how, how much value is in it? And that really changed, changed things. It's like, it's like a, people speak to me about like an epiphany. Hmm. It's like a click that changed their own identity because from then on they can be proud. Yeah, and and this, the same thing has happened in this group that I'm studying in, in Apuebla, in Peru, which is a small group. A, a moment of increased awareness, a moment of revelation, yeah, and a moment in which they have, they can, and because they can also start to challenge in those people, those who, who, who discriminate against indigenous people. So, what are your, some of your next projects now that you've investigated Ecuador, Peru, or Bolivia be next, so you could... And uh, yeah, always mm -hmm. part of my interest is performance. I really like the concept. And, uh, but uh, even though I, I just start thinking about it, but I really would like to explore like relations between uh, creativity and indigeneity. You know, like the concept of talent, like where where, where does talent come from? from, from musicians or writers or or, or poets. Yes, yeah. How how differently differently cultures actually conceptualize a talent, so the, and creativity differently. Mm -hmm. But it's very much in uh, um, first stages of 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 a project. So well. Musical performances? Yes, maybe? musical performances and, and, and writing and poetry and maybe some some theater. Yeah. The, dance, I, dance, I think yes. there, there are probably a lot of these sort of theaters of talent display or, right. or contest. Yeah, yeah because, because one of the things that I have found in my research is a concept of the concept of meta culture mm. in which you start talking about your own culture. Mm which is something that is not uh, gratuitous. That hasn't happened by itself. It, 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 right. and, and before, like 30 years ago, in Otavalo, nobody spoke about culture in those terms. Mm -hmm. now, and, now, and when they start doing that, you know, it, it's really uh, when, when they, things start to change mm -hmm. because they start to claim up ownership, they start to claim, oh, we can do this with, with this. And they, they can, they're really sent a surprise of the political power that you can get for, for, for performance, for cultural performance. But, and, and, uh, but it's an awareness that didn't exist before. But, uh, so it's, I think that's, that's very important. Well, Dr. Sergio, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much. This concludes my conversation with Professor Sergio Miguel Huarcaya. You have seen our last installment. Please see my interview with Professor Guillermo Salas of the Catholic University. I'll see you next time. Sumagia.